Greetings, saints, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I trust you are well. Uh, welcome to the second part of uh, Fishers of Men, the Fishers of Men series. And today I'm going to read from the book of John, chapter 3, from verse 14 to verse 18. And today we're going to talk about divine compassion in relation to uh, the Fishers of Men series. Verse 14 of John, chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And uh, this is an amazing passage where we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus, um, a very important Jewish official who was seeking the truth, and Jesus talks to him about the importance of of being born again, how no one can enter God's kingdom, God's purpose, God's rulership, God's salvation without being born again. And that's what we're going to be talking about, the heart of the Father in terms of salvation. How does he look at us? And one of the reasons, one of the things that excites me about this uh, series that we're doing is that we're looking into God's mind, God's heart, God's desire for humanity a peek into how God thinks when he looks at people, when he looks at us, when he looks at sinners, when he looks at backsliders. How does he think? How does he feel? And of course, we should then adjust our behavior accordingly and think the, the way he thinks and see the way um, he sees. So the first thing that is revealed in that, pas in that passage is the heart of the Father, the heart of Christ in terms of salvation. God is a God of compassion. You know, God wants people to be saved. And when I look at this, one of the things that came to me was that God is a father who is aware of the world's need for salvation and is responsive to it. So he knows that we need salvation. He knows that we are broken people. And then he's also made a way for us to be saved. He's not aloof. To the state of the world is not aloof to the fact that people are murdering one another, people uh, engaging in factionalism, in hatred, in all sorts of vices, in fornication, in sexual perversion, in drug abuse. He's not aloof to this, and it's, he's not a God who doesn't care. He's aware, and that's why he made a plan. That's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that those who believe may be saved. So God is a very much aware God, he's a very much a responsive God, a responsive Father. Sometimes we paint God with a certain brush because of certain fathers. We've got a lot of good fathers on earth, but we also have many uh, bad fathers who are absent, who are detached. And some of us or some of you might have experienced this. A father who is not there, a father who is not responsible, a father who is selfish, a father who is cruel, a father who inflicts pain and uh, doesn't nurture or doesn't protect. And sometimes people end up seeing God the same way that he's distant. He's just a disciplinarian. He's just harsh and hard. And he's just after his own desires. But scripture is showing us here that God is a, he loves us and he responds because of that love. So he's aware of the situation. He's aware of what's happening in Zimbabwe. He's aware of COVID-19. He's aware of what's happening in America. He's aware of your situation. He's aware of the need for transformation. He's aware of people struggling with depression, struggling with evil thoughts, and he's got an answer. And that's the amazing thing about God. So God is not a, a distant or aloof father. He's really aware and he's also very responsive, thankfully. And we see in this passage that God would rather save than condemn. His heart is for salvation. God does not rejoice when he sees someone uh, dying in their sin. God does not rejoice when judgment falls upon someone who sowed the seed. They've been uh, a drug addict and um, they overdose. And you see this happening a lot with uh, 
many of the celebrities in Hollywood. I was recently doing a little study on the lives and the history of the WWF and the WWE and these wrestlers. And you see how many of them die because of drug addiction and they get into drugs and um, some of them end up committing suicide or overdosing or getting into a car accident because they were high on something or doing all these crazy things. And um, one way of looking at it is saying, look, they're reaping, they're sowing, and they sowed and now they're reaping. Good for them. They were showing off with their money. They were not being responsible. But God doesn't look at people like that. God wants everyone to be saved. He wants people to come out of their sin and experience eternal life. The Bible says Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. So God wants people saved. You know, in, Kukuyu, in, uh, in Kenya, they've got a language, uh, a language called Kikuyu. And in this language, there's a, a common saying when the, someone is reaping what they sow. They say, Shauriyako, which means it's your own problem. You started it, you're going to finish it, so you're going to have to face the consequences of the behavior. But saints, God will never say to you, Shauriyako. He cares, and he wants to find a way out for you. He's responsive. And that's God's heart for us, saints. That's why the Bible even says in Psalm 116, verse 15, that God takes pleasure in the death of his saints. So when someone who knows God, who is righteous, when they die, it is precious in God's eyes. And God, in a sense, takes pleasure because he's waiting I can see a picture of a father waiting with heart palpitating, arms open wide, saying, here comes my son, here comes my daughter, now we're going to be together. Come. And he's excited. And he's seeing, you know, like sometimes you're waiting at the airport, you've got a, a relative coming from overseas whom we haven't seen in a long time, and the plane has landed, and now you're in the arrival bay, and uh, people are beginning to stream out, you know, of, of, of the, the other side of the the bay, and they're coming through those two doors and you're waiting for them and people are hugging as they, and you know your heart is palpitating that maybe the next person is going to be uh, that relative that you've been waiting to see. And that's how God waits for us. When you die in him, you die in Christ and you know Jesus. He's waiting, arms open wide, heart palpitating. And he's saying, here comes my son, here comes my daughter because you're going to spend eternity with him. But saints, God does not take any pleasure in the death of someone who doesn't know him. That's why even in the book of Ezekiel 18, verse 32, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of any man. When he's telling people, repent and live, he's saying, why die? And in, in a sense, he's saying, why die in your sin? So he's saying, I don't want you to die in your sin. Repent. And he's speaking against sinfulness. And he's saying, if you sin, you'll die. If you repent, you'll live. But he's saying, I don't want you to, to die in sin, and I don't want to judge you. I would rather have you die knowing me and live. Because that's the heart of the Father. And saints, we have to check our hearts. Do we rejoice when certain people die of COVID-19? Many things are circulating as certain people are dying, high officials and so forth. And people are saying, there you have it. This COVID thing is, is doing a wonder for us. It's killing certain people. And saints, as a believer, that is not how you ought uh, to look at the death of sinners and the death of people who don't know God. We ought to grieve. Because God grieves when one person dies and they are going to be condemned because they have not believed in God the Father. So we have to be very careful, saints. How do we look at sinners? How do we look at backsliders? You know, even in relation to a, a believer who has backslidden, God's heart is still always for restoration. And many things are happening. There is a pastor, I will not mention his name recently, who has fallen into sin and uh, we believe he's being restored. And certain people were flinging comments and negative comments, judging this person and uh, almost condemning them. But what is God's heart? And God is saying he wants them restored. Look at what happened in the book of Luke 15, verse 20. When the father saw the prodigal son returning, it says he saw him from a distance. And he ran to him. The only time God ran. And he ran to him and embraced him and received him. This guy didn't even finish reciting the, the, the repentance speech he was giving. And it was almost like the father ignored it and began to dress him in, in, in nice robes and 
have a party for him. And that was the heart of the father for restoration. God does not celebrate even when an evil or a, a sinful pastor or prophet has been doing things and then now they are put in prison or they do things. God doesn't say, yes, good. He's just saying, turn, repent, trust in me. Let go of the sin. Because, you know, God knows that once someone dies in their sin, then they've been swallowed by the satanic agenda. Only the devil wins. We don't win saints when we celebrate the death of our enemies and the death of those who do not know the Lord. So we ought to have compassion because our God is a God of compassion. We ought to pray for the lost. We ought to pray for our leaders, the ones that maybe be uh, they're getting involved in evil rituals, perhaps in sexual perversion, in greed, in theft, in corruption. Instead of saying we can't wait for judgment to fall upon them, we must be saying, Lord, it doesn't give you pleasure for them to die in that state. Let them know you. Send your workers. Send people to speak to them. Speak to them somehow, Lord, that they may turn. And that is what gives the Father. That is what gives Jesus. That is what gives the Holy Spirit pleasure. Saints. And that's how we ought to look at it. Now, talking about compassion, or saying God is a God of compassion, we need to understand the nature of this compassion because there can be a true and a false compassion. So when we're saying we ought to be compassionate as God is compassionate, we must understand what compassion means. And John 3.16, in a sense, defines for us divine compassion, which is really the essence of the message today. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave, his one and only begotten son. So saints, this means that divine or true compassion always has a spiritual therefore. God had compassion, therefore he sent his son to solve the sin issue. He's, he responded in a spiritually significant way. I mean, you look at the example of Jesus himself, for example. Mark chapter 6 verse 34. The Bible says he had compassion on them and therefore he began to teach them. His compassion caused him to start to teach them because he knew that in spite of their depravity and their pain, the thing that would really bring resolution and restoration to them is not just um, saying, oh, sorry, and uh, just giving them hugs and, and, and uh, showing them affection. It was revealing truth to them that would change their lives eternally. That is true compassion. Again, an example is Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 38. And the Bible says Jesus looked at the crowds and he saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion on them. But it didn't end there. Then he spoke to his disciples and he said, guys, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So again, he's compassionate, the spiritual, therefore, he saw they were harassed and helpless. Rome was oppressing uh, a large part of the world, including the Jewish people. They were murdering people. They were uh, burdened with heavy taxes, slavery. They were harassed and helpless, looking for a savior. And Jesus, again, was responsive to this. And this shows you, saints, that God is not aloof to suffering. He's not aloof to inflation. He's not aloof to the economic situation. He's not aloof to people dying of COVID, the poor who can't afford medication. He's not aloof. Jesus was never aloof, but he always had a response. And we need to be willing to respond accordingly he has an answer and are we willing to be part of that answer in edifying people and speaking god's heart and mind and being his hands in the situation so we mustn't give false compassion false compassion does not go beyond commiseration and pity oh sorry man shame i'll give you a hug oh that must be really terrible and it's okay to do those things i'm not knocking it but i'm saying that True compassion doesn't stop there. Because Jesus did express affection, love, but he went beyond that. And he gave a spiritual, therefore divine compassion responds with edification. Divine compassion gives God's mind and God's insight. For instance, Ephesians 5 verse 26, when Paul is talking about how husbands ought to relate to their wives, he says, one of the things there he says is that the husband ought to wash his wife with the word, cleansing her with the washing of water with the word, that the word washes. So if someone is in a very difficult situation, they are struggling with sickness, they are struggling uh, with lack, they are struggling 
with depression, they're struggling with other things, the most compassionate thing you can do for them, apart from being there for them and ensuring affection, which is good, is to give God's insight and mind into that situation. What does God say about what they're going through? And tell them that. And that will strengthen them. And that will give them enduring strength and comfort when you give them God's word and insight into what's happening with them. And I believe that's why Paul the Apostle, for instance, was willing to go to Jerusalem and die, even though you knew he was going to die. Agabus prophesied and said, you're going to die. But he said, I'm willing to die because he had God's insight on the situation. He had already been told by Ananias that he was going to suffer. And God had told him his mind on the situation. So he was willing to do what God told him. The Bible talks about Jesus in Luke 9 verse 51 that he set his face like flint and he headed towards Jerusalem knowing again he was going to die because he knew what God had told him. God had already told him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You know, God had said, this is my son, listen to him. He had affirmed him and that was enough for him. And I believe that spurred him on because he had revelation of what God was saying to him at that time. And divine compassion saints must lead us to speak God's mind in a specific situation, no matter how hard or how tough that situation is. If you're truly going to comfort that person and give them enduring strength and consolation, tell them what God's word says about them. Maybe God may give you a prophetic word and prophetic direction. Or if you don't have prophetic direction, just go back to scripture. What does it say about that situation and speak it to them and it will wash them and it will strengthen them. The final thing I want to talk about, saints, is the sole basis for judgment. Because when we're saying compassion, why are we compassionate towards the lost? Because you know that if they die in that state, they're going to be judged. They're going to have eternity, to be separated from God, and they're going to suffer. Eternally, they're going to be destroyed. They're not going to have another chance to be with the Father. And they're not going to find His rest. So we are compassionate. But we must understand, how does this judgment take place? What is this judgment? How does it operate? John 3 verse 18 tells us that the sole basis of the judgment that will fall upon people who don't believe in Jesus, the sole basis of that judgment is going to be faith. Because John 3 18 talks about how he who does not believe will be condemned. He who believes will be saved. John 3 16, whoever believes will be saved. So salvation, eternal salvation is based not on performance, works, perfection it's based on faith have you put your trust in jesus that he did die for you and that only his blood can wash you and wash your sins and you've asked him to wash you with that blood in faith and that so saints is the sole basis of eternal judgment what is your response your faith response to jesus yes we know that uh, for instance 1 corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 to 14, talks about a judgment that will take place even for those that actually do believe in Jesus Christ. But this is a judgment in line with rewards, saints, because you're going to be rewarded according to the level and the purity of your works for Christ. So there is a form of judgment even for those who do believe faithfully and who have given their hearts uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that is going to be in terms of determining your rewards. So you find that the faith principle does not just end with your salvation and your trusting God for salvation. It's actually um, to do with everything in your life, your continuous walk, your daily walk with him. For instance, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, when he's talking about the power of the gospel, and he says that we've received a righteousness from God that is uh, from faith to faith, or faith from beginning to the end. It's from faith to faith. It's not from faith to works where you believe and then you say, okay, thank you, Lord Jesus. You've done your part. Now let me do my part. Thank you. I'll take it from here. No, it's faith to faith. And I believe to faith to faith to faith. It's continuously based on faith. You receive Jesus by faith and you walk in righteousness daily by faith, trusting him to give you the strength and the wisdom to remain rooted in him. So it's faith to faith, saints, constantly and continually. As long as you're willing to believe, maybe you don't trust in Jesus, you've not put your trust in him. If you're willing right now to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to believe in you, reveal yourself to me, I'm going to trust you, wash my sins. Or you may, perhaps you're in a backslidden state, state, you've been struggling with pornography, struggling with lust, with unforgiveness, and you're just doing the act, and you know that in your heart, your heart is not with the Lord at the moment. People don't even know it. Saints, 
if you're willing to put your faith again and say, Lord, by faith, I know you can cleanse me, you can help me. Please help me, Lord. He's willing to help you and to restore you because the basis is solely faith. And you find that even when people are struggling physically, morally, with sin, it's often because of some faith deficiency. The devil is very clever. He will cause you to doubt God in some aspect. He may cause you to doubt his sufficiency, that God has got the capacity and the power to help you, to heal you, to restore you. And if he sees that you, you trust God, that he's sufficient for you, for your emotional, physical, spiritual needs, he may make you doubt his supremacy. That, okay, God has got sufficiency and power, but not, a, not in all, all occasions. He's not supreme. Sometimes God just fails. Sometimes God is just not there. Sometimes God is just not able. And he makes you doubt his supremacy. If he doesn't make you doubt his supremacy, he can make you doubt his sincerity. That, yeah, your God is sufficient. Your God is supreme. He can do anything. He can do anything anytime for anyone. But how do you know that his heart is truly for you all the time? How do you know that he is concerned for you or he's not just out for his selfish means? So you may make you doubt his sincerity. So you find that, saints, if you're struggling with some form of sin or with some form of moral issue, just check what area has, has the devil caused you to doubt in relation to God. Has he made you doubt God's sufficiency? Has he made you doubt God's supremacy? Has he made you doubt God's sincerity, integrity towards you? And when you check and find out which area that the devil has made you doubt, just line it up with scripture. Repent and say, God, forgive me, I've doubted your sufficiency or your supremacy or your sincerity. Scripture says this, so I'm choosing to believe this. And once you restore that and deal with that in your heart, you'll find that your actions will automatically follow. You won't struggle as much, if at all, with whatever sin issue that you've been struggling with. So saints, ultimately, it always comes back to faith. And when your faith is right, your actions will follow. You know, it, sometimes people try to do dead works. And let me just to close, give a, a graphic illustration. Um, if a car is dead and the engine is gone, it has no engine, there's no heart. And people say, how do you know it's dead? Because it's not moving. Then you say, okay, you jack the car up and then you start turning the wheel with your hand. And you say, oh, there we go. You see, the car is alive. Or you take a dead corpse and you say, this person is dead, so they can't move their legs and feet. Okay, I'll solve that. And then you start playing around with their hands and you start moving their hands and their legs and you say okay so this person is alive now is that person alive because there's movement in the hands and, and legs no because it's not coming from within it's not come it's not coming from the impetus of their spirit and their heart and so that work is dead so the bible talks about dead works if you're trying to live for god by performing and imitating other people and it's not coming from your heart you're just trying to do it so that other people see you it's not coming. You don't really believe it. You think it's the right thing to do. You're trying to please your parents. You're trying to please your spouse. Then those are dead works. It's trying to move the, the legs and hands of a corpse. I heard of a story of what happens in a, in a particular island. I think it's a, one of the, it's in, a, in the Mediterranean. And uh, once every year, they take out the, the mummies of their dead relatives. And they are placed on these frames so that they look, they take these posters where they look alive. And they dance and they, and they dance around these um, uh, mummies which, which have postures of living people and then they say we're celebrating with our dead ones and then at the end of the day they go and put them back in the tomb and that's a deception and sometimes people would do that those are dead works if it, if you're not loving God and serving him from your heart and you're doing it externally imitating to please people then that cannot save you God wants things that come from the heart from a sincere pure heart and true faith and believing that Jesus is the one and the only one and he's the only one who's able to help me, to save me, and to sustain me. And that, saints, will lead you and sustain you in the path of eternal salvation. So, saints, I pray that this has been helpful to some degree, fishers of men. Part two, that God wants us to be fishers of men, but he wants us to understand his heart towards us and his heart towards the lost, his heart towards the backslidden, and the sole basis for judgment that he wants to save us, which is faith. So, be blessed. Uh, keep well and walk in faith trust him and have compassion if your compassion has waned for the lost has waned for the backslidden that is actually an indication of uh, your spiritual health your spiritual health is not determined by how many scriptures you can rattle out and how long you can pray it's determined by your heartbeat towards the lost and the backslidden and if you're finding that your heart has grown cold pray to god right now turn to him and say holy spirit help me 
and awaken that compassion. And saints then will be in the very heartbeat of God. So be blessed and keep well in Jesus' name.